the presentation of anarchism, anarchism a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Militant Afterlives, Jean Grave after 1918 by Constance Bontman. This essay discusses the afterlives of activism, that is to say, what happens when activists find themselves relegated and isolated when political circumstances change radically and after they die. Afterlives also include processes of memorialization and how histories of activism are written. I would like to make a case for the merits of lingering a little on the vision of the vanquished, to use Nathan Bachtel's phrase, for what it has to tell us about militancy, both from a scholarly and from a human perspective. This is also an invitation to consider the personal, emotional dimensions of activism, which are foregrounded in these periods of retreat. I am exploring these themes through the example of one individual who had a long and complicated political career with great highs and clear lows. The French anarchist Jean Grave, who was born in 1854 and died in 1939, and who was politically active for most of this period. The experience of the 1871 Paris Commune signalling his political coming of age at 17. In addition to his decades of anarchist activism, Grave is especially relevant to the theme of militant afterlives, because his personal trajectory is so profoundly bound with the history of the anarchist communist movement in its pre-1914 incarnation, in which he was a highly influential figure, even though he, was, he has more or less sunk into public oblivion since then. At the peak of his influence in the 1890s, Grave edited anarchist periodicals which were regarded as a key vehicle for the anarchist communist ideas which were being developed by Peter Kropotkin in particular, and to a lesser extent by the anarchist geographer Elisée Reclus. The three papers were La Révolte, which appeared between 1887 and 1894, and Les Nouveau, 1895 to 1914. Those followed on from Le Révolté, 1879-1886, which had been set up in the early anarchist circles of the Jura Federation in Switzerland by Kropotkin, Reclus, George Herzig and François Dumarteret. By 1884, Kraft, now actively organising anarchist groupings in Paris, writing in the French anarchist press and working hard towards anarchist organisation in France and beyond, had been invited by Reclus and Kropotkin to move to Geneva and take over the editorship of Le Révolté. From then on, and until both men's passing, the paper, through its successive versions, was Grave and Kropotkin's baby, their boy, as the letter said fondly, while Reclus continued to support it financially. The paper was a key medium for the elaboration, the discussion and the dissemination of Kropotkin's ideas, which partly accounts for its global fame and influence over such a sustained period. As for Grave, it was indeed through the medium of print that his influence manifested itself. Grave and his papers played key roles in the French and the international movement from the mid-1880s until at least the war towards the global circulation of ideas, printed material, connecting groups and individuals, and securing funds for the paper's survival. The paper had numerous artistic links and appeared with a literary supplement of a very high standard, with eclectic contents, which translated Graf's innovative idea of making art and literature accessible to all without compromising on quality and content. The paper was also a key link in a host of anarchist campaigns for instance against colonial penal colonies, for the defence of anarchist individuals facing state and police persecution, most notably the Catalan anarchist and syndicalist Francisco Ferrer between 1907 and 1909, but also many others. In this heyday, Tav was regarded as one of the most influential French anarchists, a leading journalist and an anarchist intellectual, at a time when French anarchism wielded great influence internationally and seemed to pose a real political threat in many countries, including the young French Republic, 
Favre, however, was never popular, including among his allies. His dogmatic and cantankerous disposition were legendary across and beyond the movement, and made worse by his hostility towards innovative trend within anarchism, such as syndicalism and individualist anarchism in its various guises, which he criticized relentlessly. In the late 1880s and 1890s, when the ideology of propaganda by the deed spread through the movement, and gestures of political violence associated with anarchism occurred everywhere, Rav was steadfast in his critique of such interventions, unlike some of his closest collaborators, not least Reclus. This too established his reputation as a conservative anarchist. He was famously nicknamed Le Pape de la Rue Mouffetard, the Pope on the Rue Mouffetard, in reference to the left bank street where he lived and edited his papers between 1885 and 1914, but also as a sneer towards his pontifying manner. His late, distant and very cautious involvement in the Dreyfus affair drew further criticism from fellow anarchists. While the emergence of new voices across the movement in the run-up to the First World War made him look dryly theoretical and dated in both his style and vision. The war was the final nail in Graf's ideological relegation. By 1916, his reputation and influence were clearly on a downward path. He had by then moved to Britain, spending the war with the family of his Welsh wife, Mabel Holland Graf. It was also in Britain that he met up with with his dear friend Peter Kropotkin to draft what is probably one of the most revived documents in anarchist history, the Manifesto of the Sixteen, which based their support for the war in the name of resistance to aggressive German militarism. From Britain, Graf fell out with those comrades who had remained in Paris and continued to run the Groupe des Temps Nouveaux and were moving towards pacifist opposition to the war, while Graf was increasingly vocal in his support for the conflict. The argument escalated until Grave had the luck of the editorial office changed, effectively evicting his former comrades. The paper, which had once provided a key forum for anarchist communities the world over, was now a bitterly divisive bone of contention among close friends. Grave returned to Paris in 1919. By then, he was in his mid-sixties, but determined to resume the fight, relaunch the paper, try to resurrect anarchist organization and convinced that the strand of anarchism which he represented still had a place in the post-war political landscape. This was not to be, and Graf quickly became disillusioned. In fact, the years that followed the war read as an inverted image of his pre-war activism. His first instinct was to try and reactivate his pre-war networked, print-based activism, but within months, this resulted in the loss of his publishing endeavour, Les Temps Nouveaux, as strategic differences and Graf's alleged paranoia saw him evicted from the new Temps Nouveau team, even having to relinquish the title of the paper with which he had once been so closely associated. From 1921, Graf, with the support of two or three partners, published an irregular pamphlet known as Publication de la Révolte des Temps Nouveaux. He went on to publish 99 issues of this new series, which is which is remarkable for a one-man operation, but also definitely not a success, as the publication can only be read with a pervasive awareness of Graf's fall from grace. The once expansive list of correspondents writing to the paper or donating to it, while still commendable, was significantly reduced. While the Temps Nouveau had once had a remarkable international coverage provided by numerous correspondents and translators on the ground, both of which were great pride for Graf, There were now lengthy, one-off pieces from a single contact here and there, and no sense of continuity or meaningful engagement with current events. The paper had always operated at a financial loss, despite incredibly generous support from readers in France and beyond, from those who took part in so many fundraising efforts, and the visual artists who often gave their works to the paper for free, out of sheer anarchist conviction. Among them were artists who are now incredibly famous, Paul Signac, Camille Pissarro, Francis Kupka, for instance. In the new paper, however, financial troubles were more straightforward and simply amounted to an absent readership, with no incoming funds to counteract the deficit. Graf, having lasted until 1936, just three years before his death, finally threw in the towel with a simple insert asking, quote, In the face of such indifference, 
Why persist in speaking to those who are not interested? The pamphlet is the last one. I am ceasing publication. End quote. Long before the final issue of his beloved paper, and as early as 1919, Graf, once such a well-connected anarchist, had become thoroughly isolated, and not willingly so. Thus, these two decades in post-war Paris provide an opportunity to consider the important topic of the dissolution and reshaping of his networks, which is a striking aspect of these years. The study of networks has been a key theme in the last 15 years or so for those studying the history of anarchism. The term refers to the importance of linkages and connections which informed the anarchist movement on many different scales and were an important mode of flexible, decentralized, possibly horizontal organization. The prism of networks is especially suited to Grave, who had been so well connected and so skilled in mobilizing his networks in the period before 1914. However, for both Grave and the wider anarchist movements, there is a serious risk of distortion if we only study networks when they are expanding and thriving. One of the key points in studying activist networks is to highlight the importance of human, personal connections in political movements, because histories of activism are personal, intimate histories. They include friendship, passing or lasting enmities, arguments, but also trips or holidays spent together, romantic entanglements, hopes which may be fulfilled or disappointed, devotion and sacrifice to the cause, etc. As Laura Falster wrote in the summer of 2020 in a History Workshop Journal blog, quote, Finding friendships of the past can help to challenge big narratives that don't always make space for the nuances of intimate human connection or for the effective nature of political engagement, end quote. If we take this premise seriously as we ought to and recognize that the political is deeply personal, then a wide range of emotions and effective events must be taken into consideration. Moreover, all these bonds, be they positive or negative, are historically determined and might be fleeting and consolidated or broken by personal and political events. Grave, in his earnest directness and with his tumultuous career, illustrates all of these dynamics. For him, the disappearance of key networks was the result of several developments. Chief among these, of course, was the estrangement of friends put up by Graf's support for the war. Thus, his old friend and precious benefactor, the painter Paul Signac, wrote to him around 1920, commiserating about his eviction from the Temps Nouveau relaunch, but not hiding that, quote, one of my greatest sorrows in these horrible times was caused by your evolution at the start of the war, end quote. Another major factor for Graf's isolation was just time and the passing away of his key allies, in particular Peter Kropotkin's death in 1921, which put a strangely abrupt end to a lifelong friendship and collaboration. Graf edited a long commemorative issue of his publication in memory of his friends, recounting how a change in the scheduled departure of Kropotkin's Russian Russia bound ship in 19, 1917 had meant that they had not been able to say goodbye in person after being so close for so long. Graf mused about his friend's final years, wondering about the impact of seeing the Bolshevik revolution taking such a worrying turn. Quote, the cruel tear he must have felt, seeing his dreams of freedom, of welfare for all, horribly scattered to the winds, harshly trampled, in the very name of the social ideals which had mobilized his entire life. Unquote. This was a poignant epilogue to almost four decades of friendship. However, you might ask, beyond the anecdote that says, here is how the story of this particular militant friendship ends, does it matter to document Kropotkin's death as experienced by Graf? I would argue that this anecdote gives us a sense of the profound transformation of the political landscape after the First World War and the Bolshevik Revolution, and how deeply marginalized Krav now was, and by extension, the anarchist communist strand which he and Kropotkin had embodied. It also tells us that, in a world of major political and social upheaval, personal bonds were deeply affected, and we have to be ready to approach this period without any expectation of continuity and linearity and to accept that the bonds of 40 years could disappear almost overnight. This reveals something interesting about the dynamics of personal networks.
Nonetheless, a counterpoise to all the friendships and connections which were disrupted by the war, the development or survival of other links. One interesting example is Cut's surviving letters from the Italian anarchist Erico Malatesta, but famously opposed and ridiculed Kropotkin's and Graf's interventionist position during the war. By 1925, however, Malatesta was still writing to Graf encouragingly about the possible publication of his memoir, as Graf was struggling to find a publisher for this text. The same is true of André Girard, who had been a very close associate of Graf's at the Temps Nouveau before a major falling out before the war, during the war, but still wrote to Graf in the mid-1930s about devastating family difficulties. These examples, however punctual, show that the deep ideological and personal rifts which we associate with the war period might not have been as clear-cut as usually assumed, or, more likely, that they were patched up, perhaps superficially, in the name of enduring respect, old friendships, a shared sense of purpose in spite of differences, the common awareness of living in extremely difficult times, both personally and politically. If we consider the towering importance of the Manifesto of the Sixteen and rift over the First World War in the way anarchism is remembered and its history written, this is an essential corrective. It shows that a more micro approach focused on the individuals, on small groups, but also on unheeded, less studied periods, brings important insights regarding official narratives. Of particular note is Graf's sustained correspondence with Max Netlau, the famous historian of anarchism, but also a long-term collaborator of Graf and his papers, who, like many others, resented Graf's support for the war. Those men exchanged long letters from 1918 until 1937, in which they argued about the new map of Europe and the creation of the Slavonic states, and also came back quite virulently to the Manifesto of the Sixteen. However, their correspondence can also be regarded as a significant historiographic contribution, which documents Netlau's piecing together information about the history of the movement and checking it with Graf, clearly feeding into his monumental Geschichte der Anarchie, which he was writing at the time. In this instance, years of retreat in the shadow actually witnessed the first wave of writing the history of the pre-war anarchist movement. Graf's own memoir was finally published in 1930, lauded by socialist and republican papers, but derided, often quite cruelly, across the anarchist and revolutionary press. And yet, the subjective, often rancorous text is now regarded as a major source for the history of the French anarchist movement. In addition to the academic, scientific merits of looking at the low ebbs of activism, I would also argue that, as writers and researchers, we have an ethical duty to those whose lives we examine, not to discard them after extracting the gist of the militant heyday. For me, an especially relevant figure in this respect is Graf's second wife, Mabel Holland Graf, um, after they married in 1909. When I started researching Graf, next to nothing was known of this intriguing figure. In the handful of specialised French writings which briefly mention her, she is usually referred to as Graf's English wife when in fact Mabel was born and brought up in Wales. She was from a wealthy and very well-connected family. She was also a talented visual artist who illustrated many of Graf's publications before the war, translated pieces from English into French with Ton Nouveau publications, and reported on Welsh labour activism for the paper. All of this stopped in 1918. The Graf's were older and both suffered from various medical problems. But as Graf became an increasingly embittered and lonely figure, Mabel's voice, as it appears in letters, for instance, provides a warm and light-hearted counterpoint. For instance, in her letters to the Cornelissen family, commenting in 1925 that, quote, it is impossible to get Jean away from his garden, unquote. More generally, bringing Mabel into the story provides a corrective to Graf's portrayal as a horrible surly figure, and the reductive depiction of Mabel herself as the cash cow who funded his pet anarchist projects. Going back to the broader historiographic narrative, this stands in sharp contrast with the deeply masculinist outlook which characterised much of French anarchism, and definitely Graf's circles and publications. Graf's memoir in 1930 was dedicated to Mabel, quote, the woman who often inspired me and was always my companion and my comfort. Unquote. 
She had just died a year before, in 1929. To me, this dedication reads as a further invitation to think about the personal lives of activists and how they play into the experience of success as well as defeat. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.